So I do have some uh, uh, disclosures, and that is that some of the stuff I'm talking about today, Mayo has filed for intellectual rights and has licensed this to Binding Site, which is now part of Thermo Fisher. All right, so we have some learning objectives here today. I really want you to see how these immunoglobulin light chains will be uh, used to detect overexpressed immunoglobulins. And I'm going to show you how we're going to apply this to patients with plasma cell disorders. And we're going to, uh, at the end of this, I hope you can see how this technique can extend beyond just plasma cell disorders to other diseases. I'm going to start with some background. So to get everybody on the same page, here's our central character of the talk, which are immunoglobulins, also known as antibodies. So I want to go over the nomenclature so you can follow me with the rest of the talk. So these immunoglobulins, they're about 150,000 Daltons. They consist of four proteins, two heavy chains, which are here, shown here in the gray and the dark uh, black. And this is the part that defines the so-called isotype, whether it's an IgG, an IgA, an IgM, IgD, or an IgE. And along with that, there's typically, uh, and the mass of these, just because we're going to talk about mass spectrometry, is between 48 and 60,000 Daltons. We have two identical light chains, the kappa and lambda, and their mass is somewhere between 22,000 and 25,000 Daltons. We're going to talk about CDR region, which stands for the complementary determining region. This is the part of the immunoglobin we're going to take advantage of for doing the mass measurements. This is a unique set of amino acid sequence uh, in this region to target certain proteins. And it's unique for each immunoglobin. So we're going to use that to kind of get to the mass distribution of those. In, in that CDR, we sometimes call this the FAB region, which includes a little more than just the CDR. That means for fragment antibody binding. Again, this is the portion that has a unique uh, amino acid sequence in it. And then we have uh, here the, uh, uh, the FC portion. The FC portion is called fragment crystallizable, and that's the part of the immunoglobin that if you cleave it off will actually crystallize. But... This is uh, very common. So this isn't where the clonality is defined by. This is where the isotype is defined by. But here is where the unique part is. And this is what we're going to talk about in the, in, in the methods that we're talking about. You should also remember that these are all post-translation modified. They have glycosylations mostly on their heavy chain. But we'll talk about some of the cases where that doesn't happen. So why proteomics of immunoglobins? I think they're the best target for, for proteomics. And why is that? Well, each B cell rearranges its DNA to create this unique ID, uh, CDR region. And since these B cells and plasma cells are scattered throughout your body, there's no way to get to this genomic thing. So if you just did a, a swab, a buccal swab, and looked at that uh, DNA sequence, you would miss everything about the B cell immunoglobulins. And also the DNA sequence, you can find it, but it doesn't really tell you how much of it's being produced, right? So that's why I like the serum, looking in the serum at these immunoglobins, because uh, it tells you a lot. But there's a real big challenge here. If you look into how these rearrangements can occur, so what happens is that uh, these B cells rearrange the portion of the DNA for the heavy chain and the light chain, which I'm showing here. And if you look at the number of combinations, you can find different numbers, but somewhere in the order of two times 10 to the 12 different combinations. So that's sort of intimidating when you think about trying to find an individual immunoglobulin. But proteomics is really nice because plasma cells can outproduce even the liver cells. I used to think liver cells were great at making protein, but plasma cells are fantastic at making these immunoglobulins. And I've coined this term that I like to say is this is like disease-specific PCR, meaning the plasma cells are responding to something and you can look at what they're responding to by looking at the repertoire in the serum. But you have this 2 times 10 to the 12th, and which is really intimidating. And sometimes I think it's like looking for a needle in a haystack to look for one of these. So we're going to see how we did trying to do these kind of things. So I'm going to talk about some methods here. The methods all start by purifying immunoglobins. I can purify any fraction I want, but we purify the immunoglobins first. Then we break them into two different types of methods, and it's really different on the pre-analytical processing of these immunoglobins. So in the upper one, I'm simply going to reduce these immunoglobins into heavy and light chains. On the bottom, I'm going to use traditional proteomics, where I chew them up with trypsin. 
So in the upper method, the analytical target is going to be the light chain, not the heavy chain. And we'll talk about why uh, later. And on the bottom, we can look at these CDR peptides and they're unique and we can kind of follow those. So we've, the, we've have a couple of techniques we've been working on. The first one uh, is really this multi-top method, right? So we can use a multi-top and this is what we're using currently in the lab to replace, uh, we're going to replace serum protein electrophoresis very soon. We've already uh, replaced immunofixation electrophoresis. We've coined this term that's, that we use here at Mayo, coined by the, the, actually the hematologist. They said we had to use fix, so we call it mass fix, and that's sort of stuck in the literature. You can also insert, do some chromatography, separate out the heavy and light chains, and then go to a higher resolution instrument. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to call that high resolution mass fix in this talk, just so you know what I'm talking about. And then the bottom, we can go and use an Orbi trap, look at these CDRs, and this has been mostly used for MRD analysis. And so as you go down this list, it gets more expensive for the lab, takes more time. Uh, you get more complexity in the measurements, but the sensitivity increases. All right, so this is the basic paradigm that I need you to to follow, to follow the rest of the talk. And it's pretty simple, but hopefully you'll pay attention to this section because if you miss this, you might miss the rest of the talk. So, so the idea here is a plasma cell makes a unique immunoglobulin. And if I take that immunoglobulin and break it into its heavy and light chains, and I can measure the mass. And what I'm showing you here is, again, the heavy chains are higher in mass, but notice how I don't get a single peak. And that's because of those glycoforms. So that glycoform on the, on the heavy chain is not clonal. It varies even from the same clone between uh, uh, the heavy chain. So it's not a single mass. For the light chain, though, it's typically not post-translationally modified and becomes a single mass, and they ionize better. So that mass is what I'm going to use to follow the clone. So whatever its mass is, we're going to call the clone based off that mass. And in that intensity, it's going to be the clonal abundance. So if you do that on normal human serum with a high resolution mass spectrometry, you get this. And it was kind of embarrassing when we started trying to figure out why are we getting two humps? But really what happens is you can get different masses for the kappa and lambda light chains. They're different because they have different constant regions and that separates them into mass space. But if you have a patient that's overproducing an immunoglobulin, this is the kind of resolution you can get. So you can see here's the polyclonal background uh, demonstrated here. But then you can also get this peak, which could be the M protein, or it could be an immune response, because uh, the sensitivity of this is getting to the point where you could get either. But you also now, sometimes uh, light chains do get some post-translation modifications. We're going to talk about that, and so you always have to be on the lookout that not everything's a unique clone. Some can be actually PTMs of the primary clone. So those are the things that you need to kind of keep in mind. So we're going to now move to the application in detecting M proteins. This is the so-called mass fix uh, method. The tradition in our lab, our lab has been doing protein electrophoresis since 1967. So this has been a long ongoing standing way. We put on the gel, the patient serum five times. Oh, so again, so it's put on here one, two, three, four, five, actually six times. We add the, uh, put on a current, the proteins separate. Then we pull this off, this gel off. We fix the proteins onto here. Here we fix all of them so we can see the albumin plus the immunoglobulins down here. But then we also fix the IgG, the IgA, the IgM, the kappa, and lambda. And that's been the method that we've been calling isotypes on M protein for quite a while. Uh, we actually, uh, and this is really the significant work of John Mills, which I'm showing over here. Uh, that uh, we decided we'd just replace that by immunopurifying IgG, IgA, IgM, kappa, and lambda. We then uh, dissociate the light chains from the heavy chains with reduction. We wash out all the other proteins, and then we elude it, and we spot it on a multi-top plate. One of the beauties of this, it's very quick acquisition. You can get this in 10, under 10 seconds for every patient. And then we're going to overlay these spectra. And so uh, this is the second place where I need you to pay attention because this is going to be the common way I'm presenting all these cases from here on out. So this is the way we chose to, to present them. So we had to create our own software to look at them. And so what am I showing you here? So let's look here. Let's start with the blue. In the blue, we have all the lambda light chains. So that means I pulled down 
anything with a lambda light chain. So that could be an IgG lambda, could be an IgA cat, lambda, IgM lambda, or even free lambdas, D lambdas. Anything that has a lambda light chain associated with it is going to be pulled down, and then we're going to release all those light chains off the intact demon gums and look at their mass distribution. Okay, so these are all the lambdas. And then we're going to pull down with kappa and do the exact same thing. So anything with a kappa on it, we're going to pull down and we're going to look at the mass distribution. Then to get isotype specific, what we're going to do is we're going to pull down uh, with heavy chain specific antibodies. So these are a uh, pull down of IgG and then we release the light chains off of this. So this is not intact IgG. I say we live in the land of Prince. Prince the artist formerly known as Prince. These are light chains that were formerly on an IgG, okay? That's the way you should view this. So you look at this and you can kind of see the kappa lambda ratio is what you expect for IgG, one to one and a half, IgA one to one, and IgM. It's lower abundance and it has this high fraction of what we call heavy kappas. But if I have a patient with an overexpressed immunoglobulin, what happens is I look at this spectra and I say, okay, the, when I pull down with lambda, I see that there's an overexpressed immunoglobulin. You can see the difference in the width of the distribution between these two. Then I look at the heavy chains and say, okay, which one could have been on a heavy chain or not? And I look here and I see that when I pulled down with IgG, I got the same distribution. I didn't with IgA and I didn't with IgM. So this is an IgG lambda M protein. And this is the way I'm gonna display all the cases from here on out. So hopefully you followed that. This is what we call mass fix in the literature. So one thing we noticed, we had increased sensitivity. And this increased sensitivity really isn't the fact that I can detect them proteins. I just have better resolution now than I have from gels. Uh, and so with mass spectrometry, we get better resolution. And let me show you how that plays out between instruments on mass spectrometry. So again, if you look at this, you can see this is the IgG uh, distribution. So we see a peak in the IgG distribution and we have the corresponding same peak in the kappa. So this is an IgG kappa monoclonal protein. Now, if I go to a higher resolution instrument, notice how you can see some of the lambda polyclonal background. What happens now is I pull that distribution in, this peak gets so narrow that its height gets high and I can't even see the monoclonal or the polyclonal background anymore. So that's a difference in the resolution. So I want you to appreciate that, that the sensitivity is not so much I'm, I can see things that are, that are above the polyclonal background better only because I have better resolution, not that I'm creating any artificial uh, M proteins by doing this. But you can see this resolution, this is glycated, meaning that some of these patients, just like hemoglobin, they'll get non-enzymatic sugar added to them and they get glycated just like hemoglobin A1C. So you have to be, once you get this kind of resolution, now this comes into play where you don't really see it as well on the, the mass fix acid. If you take something like this, that uh, this is a patient that was negative uh, really for an M protein by our mass fix assay. But if I put them on a high resolution instrument, now you can kind of see what we're seeing. So again, the green now is the lambda, the red is the kappa, and the blue is now the IgG. And so you can see I got peaks that correspond here to both the green, which is lambda and the G. So I have some G lambda clones. I also have some G kappa clones, but I don't really want to call these M proteins. This is really an immune response that we're getting down to seeing immune responses in the patient. But if you look closely, you can see these three most high abundant clones. If you really look at the Maldi, you can kind of see them there, right? But these are not stuff we call clinically. We really wanted uh, to look at it. So this is the way that we call M proteins in the lab right now. We're using uh, light chain distribution to look for uh, these M proteins. Well, this increased sensitivity is really a double-edged sword, I say. In screening a patient for a monoclonal gammopathy, it may be a little too sensitive. Uh, this is one of the studies we did. Uh, Dr. Kyle, uh, who is well known for the prevalence of monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, did the Olmstead County study. Uh, this was one of the cohorts that he collected from 1995 to 2001. He screened seven, over 17,000 patients over the age of 50 in Olmstead County. And when he screened, he screened with serum protein electrophoresis. And in that case, he found 605 patients that had a monoclonal protein in them. And this is the Olmstead County cohort that we followed for years. But we had these, uh, you know, 16,000 patients that were negative in the 1990s. 
We looked at their medical records and found 300 of these patients later came back to, to Mayo and actually received a diagnosis of Mugus later. So we were curious, like, oh, if we use these new techniques, what would we have found if we had screened back in 1995 with the more sensitive techniques? So we're able to get 226 of those samples uh, from those patients. And if we tried to use immunofixation, which is more sensitive, we picked up 24 more of these patients that would have been added to the, to the Olmstead County cohort. But with our mass fix assay, we picked up over half of them. So this showed us that we were going to get some lead time bias and picking these things up uh, a little earlier based on our increased resolution using the mass spectrometry. So what did this do? If you look at the prevalence of a monoclonal protein by the type of screening method in the Olmstead County uh, uh, study where they used serum protein electrophoresis, 3% of the population had an M protein. When we added on this more sensitive free light chain assay, the prevalence went to 4%. And then with our mass fix, I did this with Dr. Vashan. She was looking at a familial study. We pulled another uh, cohort out of the Olmstead County, and now we're seeing 11%. So it went up quite a bit. And this is even with us here at Mayo throttling the assay back a little bit. Uh, there was a promise study done, done by Dana Farber. They were also looking at the prevalence of monoclonal proteins. They were using the binding site instrument that, that we licensed to them. And notice how they, they said, well, okay, if you look at below, above 0.2 grams per liter, the prevalence looks pretty uh, similar to what we got. But they started calling everything that was a small little clone. And you can see that they ended up with an overall prevalence of 37%. But what I want you to notice about that is 60% of what they're picking up these low level are IgMs, right? And so these are probably just immune responsive clones. So this is something I, I didn't agree to do because I don't like the idea of calling these uh, uh, monoclonal proteins. We only had 13% IgMs and that's because when we have patients uh, we're, and I say we're somewhere going between what's true mugus and what's a normal immune response. We're going to have to be careful with the method here. And that's because if you look at a patient like this, so this is a patient that comes through the lab. And so you can see if, you look, if I look on the lambda and kappa, I don't see any real peaks till I get to the IgM. Now, remember, IgM is really low in concentration. So among the IgMs, I can see these clones really well. But when they have to compete also with the IgGs and the IgAs, they don't really start to show a peak in the light chain pull down. So this means they're very low levels. So what I want to call an M protein on this patient, well, would it change your mind if I told you this was a 26 year old female who had hypergammaglobulinemia and had a diagnosis of lupus, right? So these are the things that we've had to kind of be careful of. Although I'm not saying that these are totally normal, these are the things that we have to be careful of with using this kind of sensitivity. But on the, on the positive side, this is where the assay really, I think, shines is following a patient with multiple myeloma. Now, it's become pretty clear that the traditional electrophoresis methods are not sensitive enough to pick up low-level disease in myeloma patients. So what has happened is that the field has really shifted to bone marrow and using either high-sensitivity flow or next-gen sequencing to pick up the residual malignant plasma cells. So this just is a study that was done at the University of Chicago by Ben Derman. Again, so this is the progression-free survival. So at this time point, everybody was screened. You're either positive or negative by the next-gen sequencing. And this is how long you went without your disease progressing. So you can see the bone marrow uh, next-generation sequencing can actually segregate those who will progress earlier than from those who won't. Uh, using a serum method, uh, they used the Maldi-Toff method. This was from binding site, not, not our exact method. And they showed that, yes, the positivity can separate who's going to progress and who doesn't progress. But if you go to the higher sensitivity, the LCES, uh, ESIMS method, you can see that we're, we're actually even out producing probably next-gen sequencing. And the significance here is this is a serum-based, this is bone marrow-based. And then combining the two, which is what uh, the mantra has now become, that the value of the serum multi or the mass fix assay is in the, uh, is in the negative, but the value of the NGS is in the positive. So that's what's been, been kind of coming out of that. And we also get increased specificity. This just shows you one patient who happened to only be making their myeloma cells, but only making a lambda light chain. So you can see this is their M protein. 
This is before they got their autologous stem cell transplant. Then they got their treatment and they came back. And post-treatment, it's not unusual to see patients that look like this as we destroy their bone marrow plasma cell repertoire and then start to repopulate it. Clones start to come up all over the place. And you can see there's a some number of G lambda, G kappa clones here. But if you're looking at for the one that's associated with the original malignant clone, you can see that this patient does not have any in the same mass range. So that's that's been a real, I think, benefit for the assay. And improved quantitation. So this is a study that was really headed by Dr. Wilrich in the audience here, where she was uh, did an international survey of labs where they spiked serum with a monoclonal drug, which simulated an M protein. And the theoretical uh, spike was 0.2 grams per deciliter. And you send it out to all the different labs and you can kind of see the variation in the number you get back based on that. And that variation really comes from the fact that the more polyclonal background we put in here, it's really hard to kind of know how to gate these, these small little abnormalities. And so our lab tends to gate all the way to the bottom, take all this area in, and you can see that the same amount of uh, M protein spiked into different polyclonal backgrounds can produce a wide range of results. We also struggle quite a bit in the lab with what we call beta migrating M proteins. About 40% of IgA monoclonal proteins will migrate within the beta region, which also contains things like C3 and transferrin. And so when I have an M protein in that beta region, it becomes a real uh, sort of uh, conundrum of how best to, to quantitate that and remove those other proteins. So for a long time, both the International Myeloma Working Group and CAP recommends that if you have these beta, you should just quantitate the IgA and, and move on. It's better probably than SPEP. And then there's this constant debate whether we should drop all the way to the bottom or tangential skim. And those are another thing that varies from lab to lab. So there's a lot of variation in these M protein measurements and hence why the International Myeloma Working Group really says that if we're below uh, one gram per deciliter, we really shouldn't give a number. But there's no lab out there doing that because if we did that, we'd hardly give any numbers whatsoever. So we all pick our different level and us, we pick at Mayo where 0.2 grams per deciliter is where we start. Uh, saying, okay, we'll quantitate it if it's above that. This is the mass spec stuff. So the mass spec, we sort of have the same sort of problem. So this is the way that we are quantitating using mass spec. So the level of the M protein, we just, let's say this is the IgG fraction. Uh, I can tell you how much of this is monoclonal. Uh, so I get the area of the M spike, the fractional area, this, and then just multiply it by the IgG quant. Uh, this is something also John Mills did when he was a fellow in my lab, and it worked really well. But we have the same question. So how much of this should I gate? Should I gate this much? How much of this should I gate? Uh, so the shape of the peak and what's the polyclonal background? We, we were kind of uh, trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a, uh, an electrical engineer, PhD electrical engineer into my lab who, who's done uh, a lot of uh, signal processing for hard drives here for IBM in town. And uh, uh, we let him loose on our data and he did a lot of interesting stuff. So first thing he did was do some processing. He took, uh, I think about 30,000 of our negative spectrum and, and generated base functions to, to model the what we would call negative. Now, I'd hate to say they're normal because hopefully we're not getting normal patients in the lab, but in terms of not having an M protein, he had took 30,000 of these, and then he's showing you here what the worst fit from these base function was on something we called negative, and we probably just ignored these clones for some other reason other than the patient actually being negative. And then he decided, because we couldn't figure out, okay, how wide should we expect the monoclonal protein peak to be? So he did this incredible modeling of a ring of ions. So if you think about mass spectrometry, we generate positive ions. We have a ring of ions. They're migrating down this flight tube. And because they're positive, they want to push away from each other. They don't really want to stay in a, in a tight pack like that. And so he modeled all this. And I'm just going to show you the final result was what he showed us was is that as our M protein goes up, more of that repulsion happens. Actually, these peaks are getting wider and wider based off of this repulsion thing. And the problem we were having when we were doing this, when we started this, when we let those basin functions go, it was trying to call some of this polyclonal background when it really wasn't. 
So after we corrected all that, we got these kind of fits. So we've been in the background, although we haven't been quantitating all the data that's been available for Mayo patients. So we looked at 6,000 different patients with different M proteins and we got these fits and it really kind of describes, it looks like it takes care of some of the weaknesses of SPEP. For example, here in this uh, uh, scenario, you can see that higher levels, the, the uh, mass spec method is getting higher numbers. And we've known that to be the case because on SPEP, we're looking for the transmission of that blue dye that can only get so blue, and then it kind of levels out. So we knew that uh, we would under SPEP underestimates at high levels, but in the low levels, because you have that polyclonal background, it overestimates. And when we saw, when I saw these functions in the end, I thought, okay, we're there. We probably picked the best way to quantitate these M proteins. It's gonna be a big shift. So what I'm showing you here is if we used our SPEP LOQ of 0.2 grams per deciliter. This is the distribution of numbers that we send to our physicians here at Mayo. You can see that there's a kind of a broad, whoops, sorry, broad distribution here. But now once we go to a, a LOQ of about 0.01 grams per deciliter, you can see that the majority of the patients that we're seeing have really low level disease. And at this point, the clinicians are forced to follow them. We just tell them there's one there, but we're not going to tell you how much so we think that this is a real improvement for patient care that will give numbers to a much lower air uh, limit. But the real main reason why we did this is really the lab productivity. This has made a big change in our uh, number of tests we can do per uh, full-time employee. And so I'm gonna take a journey of sample in our lab. So uh, this is our workflow. This is still from the Hilton building, not at SDSC, because they were all in a line back then. <laughs> So we're using a uh, liquid handler now instead of, uh, you know, a lot of the pipetting for our, our gels was done by hand. So we have a liquid handler. We found this thing called a mosquito, which actually spots our multi-plates for us. And we're using a Bruker Microflex, which is the same thing they're using in microbiology, which is called the biotyper. But to get this off the ground, we really needed to develop our own software because the software was just not capable of keeping up with the kind of volumes we were doing. We do close to six to 700 of these a day, so it just wasn't feasible to use there. So we had to, to create our software, and this is the software team on the left. Uh, this is the MassFix software that we created, and it oversees all of that. And I'm gonna show you an example of what it does. So here's how the software looks now in the lab. Up here are the patients that we need to verify. So I, as, a, as a person who signs these out, I get to click on the patient, and it brings up the spectra. Over here is where the techs have entered the diagnosis, and this is the history now. So we've gotten rid of all our paper files and all that, and now we've got a complete electronic history here. And if you look at this patient, you can see a peak, again, in the, the G and the kappa. I can notice that. But I also see another one, a little small one. It's in the lambda and the A. Well, in this era of monoclonal therapeutics, we sometimes wonder, okay, is this the drug they're using to treat the myeloma? So one of those main drugs is daratumumab. And this is one of the where the specificity comes in. We can get daratumab from the pharmacy, measure the mass of its light chain, and then we put that on there and say, okay, yeah, this lines up with daratumab. So that's probably daratumab. And then we, but we want to look at this one. So we see this small A lambda. So you can see over here, here's my history. And I'm saying, oh, the patient had an A lambda the last time. So I can click on that history. It'll bring up the last specter we saw. And now you can see, that, well, there wasn't a G-kappa there before, which makes you even more suspicious. This is a therapeutic monoclonal antibody. But then I can look at this mass. So I can see this A lambda, it pins it. Uh, this is the plus two mass, 11,403. And then it puts it back onto the, onto the patient spectra. Like, okay, this is pretty consistent. So I feel confident calling this. So this is how this case would have been signed out. An IG lambda, small monoclonal, and then a G-kappa was detected with a light chain mass suggestive of daratumumab. Doesn't necessarily have to be that. But if the patient's not on the drug, then it's probably another monoclonal protein. But in this case, the patient was on daratumumab. All right. So that's kind of up to date where we are now, what we have in our lab. And now I'm going to say you have new eyes, you get to see new things. Uh, this has been one of the interesting things of signing out a lot of these cases. I'm starting to see things that I hadn't seen before using gels, and we're going to start talking about some of those. Mm -hmm. One of the first ones I'm going to talk about is urine light chain fragments. 
we've also adopted this not only to serum but to urine and we've always kind of known that there are fragments of light chains in there but we've never really been able to characterize them and one of the beauties of mass spectrometry is we can do this and that's what this graph is trying to show you uh, the idea here is that light chains are incredibly toxic light chains can give you glomerular nephropathies and it can also give you tubular disease in your kidney. And we were wondering, well, maybe part of that is the, the fact that these light chains get taken in by the real ep renal epithelial cells, they get processed and maybe get spit out back into urine. So we have been characterizing this and this graph takes a little bit to explain, but this is the this theoretical mass of a light chain, kappa and lambda. So we have kappa on this side, lambda on this side. And then we look into the urine and we count the fragments so these are all the fragments that we've seen in the patients with the, the, that we've looked at. And you can see that the fragments go anywhere from about, about 8,500, which is still in the constant region, all the way up to about uh, 18,000, right? So here, what's, what's interesting is we can see there's some common fragmentations that happen to, to, to light chains in urine. These all happen in the constant region. So these fragments, because this is the constant region can look pseudo monoclonal, right? So that, that's something we have to be aware of. But if you look here, these are all within the variable region and these almost all were universally associated with M proteins. So we're gonna hopefully track this and maybe we'll find some clue to these patients who have these monoclonal proteins who later develop renal failure. Maybe this will be an early sign. These fragments may be an early sign for renal failure. We can intervene before they actually lose their kidney. Another one, so M protein light chain glycosylation. So this was another surprise finding for me. I told you light chains usually don't have glycoforms, but then, you know, uh, the patients never read the books as we say. So we started seeing these uh, patients. So it's in this red box is where we expect the light of uh, the mass of a light chain to be. So if something pushes it outside, well, what could that be? So we started seeing patients that had these, these kind of well, we'll call them, we used to call them the Batman sign, but there are actually multiple peaks uh, outside the normal mass range. And what we did is we did a lot of work to prove that these are actually glycosylated light chains. And to be honest with you, I thought this ruins a really good assay because these peaks are hard to see. It doesn't look as nice. This particular patient happens to have unglycosylated M protein and glycosylated light chains. So we went back to the Olmstead County study. We went through those patients and we found out approximately 5% of, of M proteins have these uh, light chain glycosylation on them. And through a series of stuff, we started looking at our amyloid patients and thought, wow, it looks like we're seeing more of this in our patients that have AL amyloidosis than patients who don't. But it, that was kind of an, a biased cross-section. So we decided to go back to the Olmstead County study where we had 25 years of follow-up. We went back to those samples from the 1990s and we found all the patients that had light chain glycosylation and we looked at their long-term uh, outcome. And this is for AL amyloidosis. Now it's a pretty rare disease. Very few patients got AL amyloidosis within the, uh, the Olmstead County cohort, but you can see that these patients with glycosylated light chains were more likely to get a diagnosis of AL amyloidosis than those who did not in the blue. And progression to any plasma cell disease was another thing that we saw is that, wow, these patients uh, that uh, had these glycosylated light chains, if you look, by the end of 25 years, they either passed for another reason or they got disease. So uh, we started saying, wow, this light chain glycosylation is kind of an interesting uh, uh, predictor of maybe some outcome. Uh, for the AL amyloidosis, a group in uh, Pavia, Italy, that's and Paolo Merlini's group, they read these papers. And so they went into their cohort where they had them sequenced and they were looking for glycosylation consensus sequence within the, the CDR region of, of the kappa. And what they showed was, here's their AL patients, their non-AL patients. They found really a hot spot within framework three that if you get a glycosylation consensus sequence within framework three and it gets glycosylated, uh, it's a high risk factor for forming AL amyloidosis. And what's interesting about that is it's a de novo uh, glycosylation consensus sequence, meaning it wasn't in the germline, probably something that came through somatic hypermutation and you accidentally put in a glycosylation consensus sequence within framework three. And this is a risk factor for AL amyloidosis. 
So Dr. Gertz then had a grant from the Waldenstrom's Foundation. He said, oh, let's look for AL amyloidosis in, in uh, IgM patients, which are the ones who get the Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia. So we started looking at those. And uh, what we found was, to our surprise, was not AL amyloidosis, but we found a high association with cold gluten disease. Uh, it's been well known that a lot of the uh, patients who get cold gluten disease have a monoclonal IgM kappa but, we, but a lot of people have IgM kappa. What was different about that? And so you can see this is a patient, again, mass shifted out here. Uh, it has glycosylation on the light chain. And what we saw was at the time in our cohort, we had 14 patients who had a diagnosis of cold gluten disease. Nine out of the 14 had light chain glycosylation, which I told you only 5% of the general population has glycosylation on their M protein. So it was a very high um, cor correspondence in this disease. And uh, <clears throat> Dr. Justovich did the uh, correlation with the CAD titer. So these patients with glycosylation had higher cold gluten titers. And then lastly, we started seeing some of these things in terms of the very odd nature of IgG4. Now, IgG4 is a very interesting antibody. I told you that you have you know, two heavy chains and two light chains that are the same, but IgG4 has been known for a while that it can do this thing called fab arm switching. Meaning I can take an IgG4 and another IgG4 and, and they can meet and somehow swap these half molecules right down the center. They call it fab arm exchange, but it's really the whole exchange of the, of the molecule. Uh, this started to show up uh, in some of our patients that had IgG4 disease and how does it show up? And we also now know that a lot of these uh, patients also, these IgG4s have a lot of glycosylation on their light chains. Here's just an example of how that looks. So you can see we have these broad humps. Now you don't see any distinct peaks in these because as far as we can tell, they're, they're part of the whole polyclonal background. So you get this polyclonal light chain glycosylation but you also get this thing where you, when you pull down with lambda, you get a peak that looks like a kappa. And really what that is, we're picking up that fab arm exchange. So if when I pull down with lambda, I'm also picking up the half molecules that have kappa and vice versa. I can also see there's lambdas within the kappa. Very interesting. And uh, patients have varying degrees of this. And so it's another study we have ongoing with IgG40 to try to understand some of this stuff. Then I'll talk a little bit about heavy chain glycosylation. And so what I'm going to talk about here is really the result of one of the Olmstead County patients. This patient intrigued me for a while. So this patient was screened in 1997, uh, was found screen negative, and then came back to Mayo in 2007 with an IgA kappa multiple myeloma. So this is what they look by the high resolution mass fix. You can see you wouldn't miss that. There's almost no polyclonal background at all. And if you did the traditional IFE, you can see they have a restricted band here. Remember, I said a lot of these migrate near the beta. This one is. And you can see this A kappa. So we went back to their 1997 sample. And when I did that on mass spec, I'm like, wow, look at that. Like, it looks really positive. But here's the IFE. And I sat there for a while and I scratched my head. What in the world? How in the world could we miss such a prominent M protein by a gel? Well, then we happened to pick up another study for a different reason. And this is really looking at uh, some bone marrow versus uh, serum. And so this work was done with Dr. Jeromovich. He was able to give us some, some plasma cells from myeloma patients. And what we did is we isolated them and then we would lyse them and pull out the, the immunoglobin inside the plasma cell. And then we looked at what was circulating in the patient's serum. And you can see what happens here inside the cell. There's none of this glycated stuff, but once it's circulating, it gets non-enzymatically glycated and we can see that. But we also, in these cases, looked at the heavy chain for this case. And so you can see that this heavy chain uh, inside the plasma cell has pretty much one glycoform plus a secondary one. But somewhere in the serum, this glycoform pattern is changing. And we're still scratching my head, like, where is this happening? Where is the glycoform being rearranged on these uh, immunoglobin heavy chains? But now there's a whole group of people now working on this over in Madison. And they're saying the liver will do this. The liver will change glyco patterns on immunoglobin. And it's part of the immune response. So interesting. But here's what IgA looks like. So inside the plasma cell, we have a bunch of glycoforms. And by the time it got to the serum, there's so many glycoforms, I can no longer count them. It's totally scrambled. So I started thinking about that, like, oh, well, this is the advantage of, of us removing the heavy chain from the, from the M protein. 
So what you see here, notice how, and this is well known, IGAs tend to migrate very broadly. So their broad mig migration probably due to this uh, heterogeneous heavy chain glycosylation, which spreads the charge out, which is what this is. But when I drop those heavy chains and only use the light chains, all of a sudden, boom, I can see these things really well. So that's uh, that's been a really unique thing. But I, but I'm really intrigued by that heavy chain glycosylation change in the in the pattern. The nature of the polyclonal background. This is uh, one of the more uh, was one of the more shocking things that I've read recently, but it doesn't seem to be getting much attention from anywhere else, probably because where it got published. But there's a group in the Netherlands and they're using sort of the same technique that we're using. They've adopted it, but I think uh, they've changed it slightly. What they did is they took normal patients, they had normal donors and they were looking at the immune response and sepsis. But what they did was they were looking at only the IgG1 fraction, which is the highest abundance of IgG. So they, they would purify the IgG1 fraction. They'd use this enzyme to turn it into the fab. They got rid of the FC portion and they purified the fab region. Then they simply just did uh, liquid chromatography on an Orbi trap and they quantified and counted the number of fabs. And this, 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 I read this paper and I was actually part of the review and I thought, oh, this, this just came right, but I couldn't find any other reason. Their conclusion was that the 30 most abundant IgG1 clones account for more than two thirds of the quantitative amount of IgG1. To me, if that's true, I hope somebody re repeats this. That, that kind of rocks my view of <laughs> how the immune system's working, but it's very interesting uh, finding. So I, I look at this distribution now and I'm thinking about it different. Is this really a mixture of high abundance and low abundance? Like high abundance are there for some reason, low abundance, maybe these more specific things you get after vaccines or exposure to antigens. I don't know. It's, it's set my imagination pretty wild here. This just shows one patient. Uh, this was another thing that Dr. Mills did, looking at one of our ankle vasculitis patients using this method over three years. And you can see each one of these peaks represents a clone. This represents where they got treated with rituximab. And you can see these clones come up, they come down. But what's interesting to me, we have no uh, proof that these are actually the, 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 the markers that we use for vasculitis, meaning the MPO or the uh, antibody. So interesting, what is this all doing in the background? I don't know, but it's very fascinating. Lastly, some of the things we saw in the Olmstead County study, this is again, this is what the immune repertoire looked like for a patient that was IFE positive in 2008. Uh, so they look very monoclonal there, but they have that glycated M protein again. And this is what they look like in 1996. So you can still see that clone that's present here, but you can kind of see that there's not this smooth repertoire anymore. There's sort of this oligoclonal background. And we saw a lot of these oligoclonal to monoclonal transitions uh, in these patients. Uh, and lastly, we'll talk about new eyes for old tests. Uh, we do ELISA testing quite a bit, but it's something I always think about. So this is our standard ELISA test for an autoantibody, right? We typically put some target down, uh, maybe anti-double-stranded DNA, and so we're looking for antibodies against that. So then they interact with that, and then we use an anti-human antibody to detect these are the things that, that the mind, mind thinks about. Well, how many different immigums are binding to this, to this antigen? I don't think we really know. Uh, what happens if a different IgG class binds then our detection antibody does not recognize? Meaning, well, let's say this test is specific for IgG and an IgM binds, right? Those are, those are chances for false negatives. And do these, do these autoantibody repertoires change over time? Meaning, do they hone to one clone? Are they men multiple different clones? So we've set off, we've done this with a bunch of different diseases. I'm just going to show one that people in the audience have helped me with quite a bit. But here's the general idea. If you take the serum, you look at what we're doing here, look at the clonal repertoire in the, in the total serum by high resolution mass spectrometry. Then I take that same serum, look for the target antigen, purify it with the target antigen and do the same thing. Uh, to see if I can see, what, what can I see? And I'm just showing you two examples here. Uh, here's the one example. So this is a patient that has heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and they also happen to have an M protein, right? And I think uh, the group, Dr. Pat Nomham's group calls this sometimes spontaneous hit or has things like that. 
But you can kind of see that here's what the patient serum looks like. Again, we have the lambda, we have the kappa, and you can see a peak in the red, which corresponds in the IgG blue. So we have a G kappa monoclonal protein here. Well, then the group binds the, the, uh, the, the autoantibody, basically, against which is the target anti-PF4 antibody, and we run the mass spec on that. And using mass spectrometry, you can get amazing resolution to kind of say, okay, this M protein is the actual target towards the, the antigen. So maybe this patient actually doesn't need B cell therapy. Maybe this patient actually needs plasma cell therapy. Here's another patient, also has a mugus and a hit. Now this time you can see the M protein here. This happens to be a G lambda. And you can see other little clones. And then this patient, when we pulled down with PF4, you can see that we did not get the same response. This was not a monoclonal response. I would call this oligoclonal response, maybe. Multiple different clones here. And so, but you're looking at here, you can kind of see them, but they're not overexpressed in the background. All right, so with that, I'm gonna close and we'll do the post-test here in just a minute and allow for some questions. But here's my summary. Immunoglobins are fascinating. I've got a complete weird fascination with them. I dream about them. I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really weird. Uh, and there's really a lot more to discover. But I also am kind of getting closer to the end of my career and want to pass this on to other people. And I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about this quote that has been a quote of mine for a while because we did, a, there was, I'm showing you all the highlights here. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen. We had to fight for funding and we had to fight to get uh, reimbursement from the insurance companies and people are scared, oh, we're changing the methods. So there was a lot of stuff there. But but I, I, I think about this quote I read from King Solomon one time. King Solomon was like one of the more wealthy people on the planet at his time. And he wrote, ah, you know, I chased after everything. I chased after learning. I chased after fame. I chased after wisdom, pleasure. All this stuff was meaningless. But this quote that he said afterwards really stuck with me. A person can do nothing better than to eat and to drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is a gift from God. And I feel like I've been fortunate to do that. Like this has been hard work, but I have a really great team around me who really live this out. They come in, they work hard and they go home and they enjoy life. And I really enjoy this group. And that's, uh, before I go to the post test, I wanna finish with this, this, just give credit where credit's due. This is the team, right? I get to be the person up here who's just the spokesperson, but the team was really dedicated to this. They worked incredibly hard. And one person who I want to really uh, point out is Mindy Cohagen here. Mindy typifies the Mayo spirit. May Mindy comes in, works hard, never gets really upset, but she doesn't really get a lot of credit. So I decided today, if you have anything good to say about this, send Mindy Cohagen a note and tell her that you really like this work because she uh, did a lot of this work and without her, none of this would be possible. Can I ask one more question? Since we don't have any online yet. Okay. <laughs> so in the audience. So what would define a clone? Would just the sequence, or you think like constellation contributes to the definition of a clone identity of it? So you know the autumn the, the drug manufacturers put a lot of time into studying the glyco patterns of heavy chains, and there's a whole uh, science out there of glycosylation on heavy chains that that's available for us to look at. Uh, that's a good question because, you know, this finding that this glyco pattern can change from the plasma cell out into the peripheral it starts to make me wonder, you know, is this always changing? You know, when, when we get sick, we always talk about the sed rate, right? The sed rate goes up when you get sick. Well, what is that? Like, well, it means that your viscosity is going up. So one way to increase the viscosity is take all your proteins and make them more hydrophilic in your serum. And glycosylation might be one of those mechanisms, right? So... I wouldn't, I think I would still define the clone by the basic amino acid sequence of the protein and not the glycosylation. That's just my opinion. But uh, the group in the Netherlands that you saw, they're, they're defining a whole thing. They're getting ahead of me now where they're like defining clones, not only based off their mass, but also the retention time and the chromatography. And they're defining these kind of things to kind of start characterizing these large number of clones. And they're doing it in all kinds of diseases. They did it in COVID patients. They're they're, they're starting to leave us in the dust, so I need to get busy. Glycosylation <laughs> is a dynamic sort of pattern that can be regulated by 
hepatocytes, sure. or even the plasma cell themselves as well. Yeah, I don't know what those regulations, you know, uh, was at a conference at AACC and the guy asked, are you a glycophobe? Meaning, meaning, are you are you intimidated by glycostructures? And I'm still intimidated by glycostructures. <laughs> so I don't know that science very well. I think it's something I need to get more familiar with, but uh, yeah. Okay. We've got a question online. So could glycosylations be a therapeutic target? I'm sure it could be uh, for AL amyloidosis. I just know that through the drug companies have been asking and talk to me about it. And maybe that's what they want to talk about. I don't know. Uh, certainly could be. Yeah. I'm wondering whether uh, in any way or in the future, we're going to target to the detail of the protein structure of the monoclonal and for the protocol purification, uh, my question whether it does apply for all because the uh, sample variety uh, different in happening. If we use the one protocol to, for the purification, whether we can observe or we can get or not information, we yeah. So for those of you who might be online didn't hear the question, it was a question about studying, you know, are we going to study the structure of some of these uh, glycosylated light chains? I would love to do that. Um, but my first priority is to the Mayo Clinic lab people. And so <laughs> unless I can find a good uh, test to do out of that, I think we're going to leave that for the basic research. And I think there are people now, I know in Italy, they are starting to look at these structures and the folding patterns of them. Light chains are incredibly interesting. At one point, we wanted to create a light chain standard that we could use as an internal standard. And I had this group uh, uh, try to do it. And they told me every time they truncated the sequence of a light chain, it killed the expression of vector. So it's a fascinating how some of the toxic these light chains can actually be in some under some circumstances. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot to do and to understand here. Thank you for participating please click the button below to complete the evaluation and obtain credit.